hear these words from our Lord Jesus. I am the bread of life. All who eat of this bread will live forever. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me and I lay down my life for the sheep. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who abide in me and let me abide in them will bear much fruit. And finally, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though they die, yet shall they live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. This time would you stand please and let's join together in the singing of the hymn, Just a Closer Walk with Thee, and the words will be up on the screen. may be seated. Let me make just a couple of announcements to you this morning. First of all, the idea of masks uh, with things that are going on, we leave that up to you. We just ask that with a gathering this size and being this close in proximity that you be aware of uh, others. Um, 
in that there are masks on the back table, there is disinfectant on the table, there are wall mounted units of disinfectant if you need it. Uh, we are thrilled that you are here. We are thrilled that there are so many attending here and just want you to um, be comfortable and to feel safe. The restroom is around the corner, one of them up on this floor here, uh, just beyond this curtain here, there is a restroom. If there are also a women's restroom at the bottom of the steps and to your left, and a men's restroom at the bottom of the steps and to your right, okay? So if you need those, those that's where they are. The meal plan is this. Uh, after the service, there will be a group that goes to the cemetery and for the committal service. But everyone, regardless of if you go to that or you do not, you are welcome downstairs in the basement. There is plenty of food. We encourage you to go down and fellowship, share your memories, and uh, allow the room to be filled with laughter after this is over. So immediately after the service, if you are not going to the cemetery, cemetery, you may go downstairs and our servers will be ready to serve you. We've taken all the precautions we know to take. They will be masked, they will be gloved, and the food itself will be uh, done in such a way that um, we are limiting the amount of people who have contact with it. And so those are things that are important. Hopefully everyone got a marble. Did all the adults get a marble? That's very important. Uh, I was gonna, I probably, you know, somebody said to me, I think it was Larry, uh, said to me, like somebody, somebody was asked if they got a marble from Charlie and they said, is the Pope Catholic? I'm sure you all have marbles in the past, but the marble today is very, very important to us as we work our way through the service. With that, I greet you. Welcome here to this place to honor this man and to worship our Lord and to celebrate the resurrection. Would you join me in the call to worship? May the God of all peace be with you. Lift up your hearts. Call upon the one who offers comfort who gives strength to those who are weak. Let us pray. God of grace, in Jesus Christ you have given us a new and living hope. We thank you that by dying, Jesus has conquered death. And that by rising again, he promises eternal life. Help us to know that because our Lord lives, we shall live also. And that neither death, nor life, nor things present, nor things to come shall be able to separate us from your love. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
There is one more brief thing to announce, and that is that the service is being recorded. It will be on the church website probably by late afternoon or early evening for family that is out of town. That they can access that through the church website and they can actually participate you know, in this. It will be posted there and it will remain there. So family members who couldn't make it, if you know of them, uh, make sure that they know that. Our readings this morning from scripture begin with Psalm 23. I would ask that you would take your bulletin and let's read that psalm in unison together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our second reading this morning comes to us from the book of Job chapter 19, and I read these words to you. Oh, that my words could be recorded. Oh, that they could be inscribed on a monument, carved with an iron chisel and filled with lead, engraved forever in the rock. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. And I am overwhelmed at the thought. And our final reading comes to us in the way of doxology. Now all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Amen. Well, my words this morning, I have, I have sought to try to make sure that I stay in control of myself. Those of you who know my personal history with Charlie, we were very, very close, and so these words mean a great deal to me, and as Charlie's life did as well. Ministers are always supposed to stand and be strong for everyone. I confess to you my weakness this morning and ask that you would have grace towards me in that regard. You know, as a people, we are obsessed with greatness. I don't know what it is, but we proudly promote the idea that we are the greatest nation on the face of the earth. In the sports world, there's this endless debate, Michael or LeBron. Endless polls ask us to vote on the greatest this or that of all time. In music, is it the Beatles, the Stones, the Boss, or on and on and on. Or the all-time greatest movies, The Godfather, or Gone with the Wind, or Twelve Angry Men, or It's a Wonderful Life, and on and on and on. Who's the greatest actors, <clears throat> the greatest songs, the greatest literary works, greatest athletes or sports teams, leaders, even beauty queens? We're inundated with awards, shows that we watch that inform us of this year's greatest. We have the Oscars, the Emmys, the Grammys, the Country Music Awards, the Heisman, and more. We have the Super Bowl, college football championship, NC2A basketball tournament, all with the idea that want to captivate us so that we will see 
who will emerge as this year's great sports team. I'm not sure why we carry that fascination as a culture. The idea of greatness simply doesn't hold the same lofty place in cultures of the past, nor is it a concern of cultures in the third world, or most other cultures for that matter. Perhaps it's a personal need that we Americans have to measure ourselves or compare ourselves and our ideas against others in a determined effort to identify who's winner and who's a loser. Perhaps it's some subtle need to be connected to greatness by association. I'm not sure. I only know that our fascination with greatness is alive and well. But I tell you this morning that what we consider to be great and how we arrive at measuring greatness is a far cry from the biblical idea of greatness. Jesus informs us that the greatest among you shall be the servant of all. Jesus tells us in another place, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of God. In the Jesus world, servanthood and humility are signs of greatness. And the greatest virtue one can possess is not a personal talent, it's not a personal ability or some personal achievement or some physical attribute. It's not some status that someone attains, but it's a rather simple, profound idea of love. Love that is exhibited in humble service to others. All of this brings us to the reason that we're gathered here this morning. We are here to corporately, together, as family and community and community of faith, to remember the man, Charlie Leader. Charlie was never blessed with great oratory skills. Sometimes it was hard to follow and to listen to him. He never possessed great physical stature. He had never arose to great prominence or status. Yet Charlie was the epitome of what the scriptures label as great. Charlie's life was a constant display of humility, of serving other people, and of ways to shower people around him with love and generosity. Our community is a better place because Charlie Leader lived here, worked here, worshiped here, and worked here in our town. Our church is a better church because Charlie Leader decided to live out his faith among us and he gave himself in service and sacrifice to us. And my life is a better life because Charlie Leader embraced me as a man. He faithfully walked with me as a friend. And he modeled Jesus' greatness for me as a fellow believer. I learned so much from watching him. Watching him live out his values. I learned so much from receiving his counsel and witnessing his generosity. He made me want to be a better man. He made me want to be a better follower of Christ. He made me a more loving and generous soul. I've never met a man who had a more powerful and positive impact and influence on my life than Charlie Leader. Over my 40 plus years of doing ministry in regards to funerals, I've always been a bit uneasy when the celebration of life for the departed takes on more importance in the funeral service than the celebration of the wonder of our great salvation from our Lord. Our Lord's life, our Lord's death, and our Lord's resurrection from the dead 
and our future hope of everlasting life are the primary reasons that we gather during these times. And yet today I find myself dangerously close to violating my own ideas and guidelines. But I think I can justify it because what I witnessed in Charlie was so beautifully embodied in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, I think in celebrating Charlie's life, we're in fact giving witness to the power of the resurrection of Jesus. I'm not suggesting that Charlie was Jesus. He was way too stubborn for that. He was far too bullheaded for that. And he was far too set in his ways to qualify for such status. But I think it's interesting that a good part of his stubbornness was directed towards giving his life to what he saw as the calling of Christ, no matter what others thought. Charlie had his flaws, make no mistake, just like everybody else. But his virtues allowed all of us to overlook those flaws and see God's grace and compassion instead. I want to share with you two stories that sum up Charlie's life from my perspective. They're part of the riches that he deposited in me. The first story has to do with his company. In one of our times together, he shared with me a matter of deep personal concern and sadness to him. It was a number of years ago. I don't know. I was trying to remember. It was, it was back enough that I can't remember when exactly. But there was an economic downturn that affected his comp company, and he was sharing his struggles as the owner. He was faced with the possibility of having to lay off some of his employees because of the length of the downturn. I didn't quite understand all of that, but as he laid out his philosophy of business, it wasn't hard to see why he was having such a struggle. You see, for Charlie, his employees were not replaceable commodities that served as a means to his company's success. They were instead family. In a unique way, their families became his family. And he felt personally responsible that those who served in his company, that they were taken care of no matter what. And during the tough times, he felt the burden to keep them employed, sometimes at his own expense if necessary, so that they had enough. And then he shared with me this. His customers, he saw, were not buyers of goods and services but they were rather partners in business who deserved the very best product and the very best service. Offering integrity and quality, serving them above and beyond and making things right when things were wrong, went wrong, were part of his core values and principles of his personal mission statement. Customers were to be satisfied even if it resulted in additional expense to his company and during tough times that became very difficult to do. These two examples from our time of sharing life provide a great window into his soul. But they're signature traits that represent who he was and what he thought. He chose people over profit. He chose Christian witness over maximized business potential and revenue. In good and profitable times that was easy and scarce. In difficult times it was painful. And yet he never wavered. He believed that God had given him his business, and he was determined that God's reputation would be honored in the operation, even if it cost him something. And then there's the second story. People in our church, you don't know this. It arises from a conversation that we had over lunch. One of my biggest joys was he would stop by. He would call me and say, hey, what you doing? I'm going to stop by in a moment, and then we go out to lunch. We were at Ridgeville Corners. We went everywhere. Anywhere you could imagine, there was a meal. Charlie took me to it, and we would converse over lunch. One of those times, he shared with me a desire that he had to take the abundant blessings that God had instilled in his life the profits from his company and the financial rewards that he had, and he had a desire to share that with those who were less fortunate. 
He wanted to create a charity fund that could be used to assist people and organizations. A fund that would do so without fanfare and a fund that would do so without any bureaucratic red tape. He didn't want others to know who was behind it. He didn't want others to know people's needs. He just wanted it done. And he said to me, I trust you. You have your pulse on the city. I want to set this fund up. He wanted them to know that somebody cared and that God was good. And over and over again, he came to me to make sure that there was money in place to meet the various needs in our community. He cared about our community that much. He was that faithful in living out his faith. Two very important ministries in our community, pillars of success, helping those who are homeless, and together we can make a difference helping those who are less fortunate for items with items that are not covered in food stamps. Both of those organizations owe a great deal to their startup success because of the finances that Charlie offered and they received through this fund. I will tell you that over the years, untold numbers of families in our community kept their homes. They kept their autos in repair. They kept their lights turned on and water in their faucets. They put food on their table because of his vision of charity. Dozens of single moms in our town have been able to continue on amid their personal struggles because this man thought about sharing his blessings from God with others. These two examples define the life of Charles Burley, leader. They describe it far better than any words can. They speak to his vision for life and they testify to his faithfulness. Personally, I will miss our impromptu weekday lunches. I'll miss his frequent visits to our church office to make sure that Deb and I were coexisting peacefully and getting along. I will miss his counsel during the trying times in my life. I will miss his constant reminder to trust the Holy Spirit at all times. I will miss his signature chuckle. It always followed my stories of humorous misfortune in my own life. His chuckle that emerged in Julie and I's bantering back and forth. I will miss his unwavering faith in me as a man and a minister. I will always miss his ongoing banner with Bob Elliott. It was always a banter at lunchtime following our Sunday morning worship service. Julie and myself and Bob and Charlie would head out to some place to eat and then they would begin arguing over who was going to pick up the tab. Yet two old bullheaded men who stared each other down and fought over who was going to pay for the tab. I will miss that. Those arguments, by the way, normally ended with something to the effect from Bob Elliott. And if you don't know Bob, Bob is our 100-year-old gentleman in our congregation who is seated in the back. It always ended in something like this. Bob would rise up in his voice and he'd say, listen here, son, I'm old enough to be your father. Do you want a spanking? <laughs> now give me that bill. I will miss that. I'll miss his positive affirmations of my sermon that he always gave me on our way home from church. Affirmations that I always thought, well, if Charlie was pleased, that's a good thing. Affirmations, though, that continued right up until the very end. And in this past year or so, he began to sleep well before I began to preach. And he would still affirm how good my sermons were. <laughs> and then I realized maybe, maybe, I was taking too much with all of that. I will forever miss these things and so much more. I know that you have your stories 
of Charlie and what you will miss. I suppose all these things affect me so much because I saw in him what I perceived to be a faithful expression of the life of Jesus. The life of Jesus was so evident in that man. It was so vividly put on display for everyone to see. For Charlie, the faith was the cornerstone for everything he did. Faith directed him to value the importance of others over the importance of himself. This faith of his was non-negotiable. It was his window into the world. And that faith and that idea of others being more important is what points all of us today to the marble. The marble. The marble's traveled all over the world. And it's found its way into the hands of tens of thousands of people. So I'm going to ask you, if you would, to take it and put it in your hand right now. Would you do that for me? The marble. I know you've looked at it. I know you've seen it many times. You probably have a whole storehouse full of them at home. But I want you to read it and look at the words that are on the marble, if you would. And I want you to think about it just for a second. These words were Charlie's life. He lived this out among us. So if you would, with marble in hand, would you take just a moment, reflect upon his life, and would you offer your own personal prayer to God in the way of saying thank you for bringing this gift into my life. Would you do that? Let's take just a moment and quiet ourselves. Thank you. The God who promised to walk with Charlie, who never failed to sustain Charlie even amid the difficult times in life, who over and over again led Charlie in a life of generous compassion, the God has called him home. God's received Charlie into his place of rest where he awaits his eternal inheritance. And God assures all of us who are here that what has been taken from us has been safely deposited into God's loving care. The scriptures tell us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We're confident of this because the scriptures inform us that in a place called Gethsemane 2,000 years ago, Jesus stared straight into all of the world's sin and brokenness. It was a sight that caused him to sweat, as it were, drops of blood. And a few hours later, he carried that sin and that brokenness to its ultimate climax in a horrible death on the cross. But that sin and death did not have the final say in the life of Jesus, and it does not have the final say now. The same scripture tells us that after three days in the tomb, Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of God. And in that glorious resurrection, God has forever declared that sin is defeated and death will ultimately be destroyed. And that new heavens and new earth will someday usher in a kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy that will reign forever. At the core of our Christian belief is the fundamental truth that life conquers death because Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. Scripture calls it the inheritance to which we are born anew in our baptism. It is an inheritance that we affirm with our faith and then confirm with our obedience in our life. 
It's an inheritance which we receive at the end of our journey at the last trumpet. And we are told that nothing can destroy or spoil or in any way corrupt this inheritance. And we are certain of its uh, future to everyone who is faithful. I want you to know this morning that it is to this inheritance that Charlie has entered. There is no more sorrow. For him, there is no more tears. There's no more mourning, and there's no more pain. The journey that began in Charlie's baptism, where he by faith was buried with Christ and raised with Christ, that journey is now complete. Charlie has lived his life in faith. He's experienced death with Christ, and he will be raised by Christ into eternal life. Like everyone who has gone before us, Charlie has fought his good fight. He has finished his race. He has kept the faith, and now he rests from his labor. And if he hasn't already, he will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. It is there that Charlie awaits the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award him on that day. Amen.
Would you all stand with me? And let us pray. O oh God, be whom, before whom generations rise and pass away, we praise you for all of your servants who have lived this life in faith, who now live eternally with you. Especially we thank you for your servant Charlie, whose baptism is now complete in death. We praise you for the gift of his life, for all in him that was faithful, for the grace you gave him that kindled in him a genuine love for life and for his friends, for his church, for his family, and for your dear name. God of compassion, move us from mourning our loss to rejoicing, the rejoicing that comes with the knowledge of eternal life. May your special grace this day be upon truce, be upon Dennis, Cindy, and Diana, and upon their families. May that grace be upon his sisters, and upon all of us who mourn his loss today. In our sorrow, help us find peace. In our fears, help us find strength. In our questions, help us find faith. And in our loneliness, help us find your healing presence. These things we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, as you are standing, I would invite you to join together in our closing hymn, <clears throat> Oh Master, Let Me Walk with Thee, one of Charlie's favorites. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with all of your saints. 
where there is neither pain nor sorrow nor sighing, but life everlasting. Into your hands, O oh merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Charlie Burley, leader. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into his blessed inheritance within your eternal kingdom, and into the glorious cloud of faithful witnesses who have gone before us and surround us. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And now may you receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This concludes our worship service. As I shared with you, the, the downstairs basement is going to be open for your eating and your sharing memories. We encourage you to do that. And we will allow now Brooke and his associate to dismiss us and to take us to where we need to go. Mm -hmm.